How do you tell a spiritual attack from a regular setback? How do you know if what you just experienced was coming from another person or from Satan attacking you? From the natural standpoint, it can be quite difficult to tell when you are truly under a spiritual attack. In this video, I will share some biblical signs that will help you identify spiritual attacks so that you can know how to deal with them. What is a spiritual attack? Simply put, a spiritual attack is an attack by the enemy against a child of God with the intention to steal, kill, and destroy. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus tells us about the source of spiritual attacks, the devil. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And the apostle Peter in his own epistles told us to stay on guard because the enemy is always roaming about seeking someone to pounce on. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-9 through 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So, whenever you see something in your life which the Holy Spirit or the Word of God clearly doesn't align, you are under a spiritual attack even though that thing looks or feels easy, sweet, or good. Here are some biblical signs to watch out for so that you can properly identify and deal with spiritual battles the right way. Number one, you are under constant exposure to temptations and sinful tendencies. A Christian who is in a position where someone or something is constantly and easily luring them to sin is under a spiritual attack. You see, the devil knows that he cannot possess a Christian. Why? Because a Christian is occupied by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Two contrary spirits cannot live in a single person. Light and darkness cannot coexist. However, the Christian has a challenge. Even though the devil cannot possess you, he can manipulate, deceive, and oppress a believer to try to make them do the thing he would have easily made them do if he could possess them. The devil will always try different means to divide your focus and test your allegiance. He wins the fight each time he successfully gets you to do what he wants and displease God. How does the enemy send you temptations? He will use those things that appeal to your fallen nature, to the flesh. For some people it's sex, for some it's lust for power or money, for others it could be greed. James chapter 1 verses 14 through 15 says, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. He knows that these things are powerful and damaging when they get a hold on you. He also knows that it will take help beyond yourself to resist those things because they are things your flesh craves. You have to resist that temptation to watch sexual content on your phone or computer. You have to resist that urge to engage in sexual relations with someone you are not married to. You must resist that urge to steal or falsify those documents. You have to. Your victory as a Christian depends on it, and God has given you the authority of the name of Jesus. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, So submit to the authority of God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. I know it is naturally difficult. But that is why you have the Holy Spirit to comfort you in the storm. Don't worry about how fierce the pressure is. If you can trust the Holy Spirit to sustain you in resisting the devil for long enough, the temptation will pass and the enemy will flee from you. Number two, someone you are connected with directly or indirectly is influencing you to compromise your faith and God's instructions. The Bible calls Christian warfare the fight of faith. It is the contest between the Christian, their flesh, and the devil. The enemy's goal is to devour you, and in order to do that, he needs to get you to cast aside your faith. The Bible encourages us to be on guard for this. Your faith is your treasure that you must protect. It will reward you if you stand in it until the end. For the Christian, the faith is not only about confessing belief in God, but of how that conviction influences our daily lives in agreement with the Word of God. Hence, a sign that the kingdom of darkness is attacking you is that Satan is using someone or something in your life to influence your negativity. The Bible warns us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Yokes in themselves are not bad. What makes a yoke dangerous is that being behind it. When you are yoked to Christ and the Holy Spirit, you are in a partnership with God and are headed in the direction of glory and well-being. But if you are yoked to an unbeliever, such a partnership is a burden for which Satan is responsible. I like to imagine being unequally yoked as having a yoke placed on a mature cow and a small goat. There is such a difference between these two animals that the job or journey would be difficult for them to make together. It would even be better if they were by themselves. Yoking them together would wear them out ten times faster than if they were both the same height. Today, you have people in positions where they influence a multitude of people, especially young people. Influences can be from friends, social media personalities, celebrities, movies, and preachers. If anyone in your life is constantly influencing you to go contrary to what God's Word says, and you seem powerless to go against them because of how much respect, love, or value you have placed on them, you are yoked. If you do not deal with this, you are soon to wear yourself out spiritually in struggling and will embrace their lifestyle against God's plan for you. This is a spiritual warfare that you must protect yourself against and deal with. How? By cutting off your attachment and breaking their influence over you. God is not showing you what to do with your relationship with unbelievers because you shouldn't love them. On the contrary, you must know that love is not approval of everything. That you love someone does not mean you will allow them to kill your children. It would protect your baby at all cost. And the Bible tells us to protect our hearts with all diligence because our lives depend on it. If your relationship with anyone starts going against your belief in God's instructions concerning you, then you must make the decision to disconnect from them. Your salvation and soul come first. Don't keep a friend and lose your soul. Number three, you are receiving a miracle breakthrough or power when you know you are not ready to handle it. God blesses his children with miracles, power, open doors and breakthroughs, but Satan also does the same. The difference is that, of course, they are not on the same level. Whatever God gives you is good and will add value to your life, but whatever the enemy brings into your life will bring nothing but evil and destruction. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Before God brings you into any position, gives you any power, or causes you to experience a breakthrough, He will first prepare you for it. God never gives you something He hasn't prepared or equipped you for. If you get what you want and don't know what to do with it, you may abuse it and it might destroy you. There is a time for everything. A man of God once said, not all doors are opened by God. Even prisons have doors. Some open doors have led many people into captivity. Yes, God delivers and protects His children, even when they fall into such dangers. Yet it is important that we are on guard so that we can know how to read the signs whether God is responsible for a blessing or not. It is not good to always rush into every opportunity that presents itself to you. And oftentimes, it is not from God if it puts so much pressure on you, takes away your peace or appears as if you will gain many things at the detriment of your time with God, service to His kingdom or obedience to His word. So, whether you have just been given a position of power, which you can see that you are not mature enough to handle, or perhaps you are getting offers that look like answers to prayers, but you know it will require sacrificing following Jesus, your spiritual character or values, or your spirituality as a whole to handle it, you must not give in to it. Peace and grace are proof that what you have been given, though heavy, is still from God, and He will strengthen you to do it. Anxiety, fear, abuse, and instability are proof that something didn't come from God, and it wants to destroy you. Reject Satan's offer. Don't be hasty to get into the blessings of God. He promised it. Let him fulfill it, not you. Wait on the Lord, and he will honor those who do. Number four. 
The things you are seeing in God's word and according to his visions for you seem out of reach even though they have come around you. I had to put this in at the last minute because it is an issue. Believers everywhere are dealing with one spiritual warfare or another. Some people come from a family line where no one gets married and those who do never last. Some are coming from families where people die of one disease or another once they reach 30. Some are watching their children go from obedient and God-fearing to rebellious and arrogant before their very eyes. I could go on. Now, please note that sometimes God may allow certain things to happen so that He can carry out His plan for you. However, the Word of God has told us clearly that God does not bring evil on His children. Circumstances may be hard, but they will never be evil. It is not God's promise for your children to die at a young age or from doing drugs. It's not God's promise that you will lose your life the day of your breakthrough. It is not God's will that you have to spend money on sickness that comes any time you receive money. That, my friend, is the devil, and you are in a spiritual warfare. You must rise up and rebuke the devil over your life, family, and health in the name of Jesus, or else he will continue to have a field day. This warfare, you are not fighting to beat the devil because Christ has already done that. What you are doing is enforcing what God has said over you against what the devil is doing. You have to pray, fast if you have to, but pray standing on God's promises concerning his children. Thus, you are submitting to God's authority. Then you can resist the devil and command him to leave your life, loved ones, and possessions alone, and he will. Lastly, number five, you are sleeping spiritually. Most believers do not know this, but spiritual slumber is a thing. That's right. When a Christian is sleeping spiritually, here are some things that will show it. One, you will lack spiritual sensitivity. They won't be able to tell where, when, or how God is moving in or around their lives. Two, they will lose spiritual interests. Things like prayer, studying the word, fasting, attending church, or engaging in kingdom activities will no longer stir them. They will have an excuse to avoid them or to rush through them without any heart. Three, because they are insensitive at that time, they will always deny that they are under an attack from the devil. Jesus himself warned us to make sure that we are awake so that when he returns, we won't have dozed off and let go of things we were supposed to hold on to until the end. This does not mean that you should consider everything around you as warfare against you, but it also doesn't mean you should walk around with your guard down. The Lord has warned us to stay on guard at all times for a reason. The devil is always on the move, and you must be intentional about standing in the victory of Christ. When you are awake, you will notice that complacency is creeping in, disinterest in the things of God is creeping in, lust is attempting to grab hold of you, or a person is obviously sent by the devil, and you will rise up and deal with them. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. He rises up through us and nullifies Satan's attacks on us. We must therefore not be sleeping so that we do not miss these signs nor miss the Spirit when He rises in us. Someone once said, you cannot have a positive life and a negative mind. Negative thinking takes your life out of control and changes your life negatively. In one of our previous videos, I shared how the Lord delivered me from an attack on my mind. I was being attacked with a barrage of negative thinking that was causing serious depression. This depression caused me to be angry at the world and those who genuinely cared about me. When the Holy Spirit intervened, I knew I'd been believing a lie. If you do not overcome negative thinking, it will change your life. It will turn you into what you're not until you can't remember who you used to be. Negative thoughts result in problems such as anxiety, depression, stress, and low self-esteem. What are negative thoughts and what is negative thinking? Negative thoughts include negative or impure beliefs that you might have about yourself, about your situation, about life, and about other people. Negative thinking can affect your mood and emotional stability. It can even be involved in certain mental health conditions. In fact, negative thinking will open the door for the devil in your life. Negative thinking involves thinking thoughts like, I'll never be good enough. They must think I'm stupid for saying that. 
That situation is destined to turn out badly. I'm all alone and no one cares about me. And she says she cares, but I know that deep down she just wants to get something from me. You need to know, as a child of God, that one place the enemy attacks every human being is the mind. Before he gains access to corrupt or destroy anyone's spirit, he first attacks their mind. If he can attack and beat you in your mind, he will crush your spirit. This is why the Bible says that you must protect your heart with all diligence. Proverbs 4.23 Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Take note of those words, everything you do flows from it. Another translation says, out of it are the issues of life. Your life's issues are connected to the kind of information you accommodate in your mind. For some of us, negative thinking involves jumping to conclusions about others or making negative assumptions about how events will turn out and then catastrophizing about the outcomes. Imagine concluding that your project is about to fail before even finishing it. Believe me, you're setting yourself up for failure in the long run. Remember, everything you do flows from what enters your heart. Perhaps you have a problem with overgeneralization. This means that you use your ideas or perceptions from one experience as your only reference to deal with other future experiences. This will limit all your future experiences as you never go beyond what you already experienced. Joyce Meyer in her book, The Battlefield of the Mind said, Our past may explain why we're suffering, but we must not use it as an excuse to stay in bondage. Yes, something negative happened to you in the past. You don't have to use that to allow it to define your future and identity. Your negative thinking could be self-demeaning thoughts, lustful thoughts, or bitter and unforgiving thoughts about others. Like I said before, when the devil wins you over in your mind, he defeats you in your life. But if by the power of God you overcome the weapon of negative thinking, God can change your life and give you the victory over the enemy. The Bible tells us that we're in a battle. This isn't with human beings or physical things for that matter, but with anything that exalts itself against God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5 the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What does this mean? Well, sometimes a negative thought may not appear bad in itself, but it's still unhealthy. For example, Say someone offended you, and you were right and they were wrong. If you do not overcome the series of negative thinking that will follow each time you think about them or what they did to you, you will later discover that you've become a prisoner to the past, unable to move forward or prosper because of the negative feelings you are holding on to. This is what the Bible calls strongholds. Each time you give in to negative thinking, you give the enemy a building block in your life. The more negativity surrounding your thinking patterns, the more bricks you give the enemy to erect a structure in your mind where demons can come and go as they please. This is why whomever has given so much time to negative thinking has more and more difficulty with those things they think about the most. For example, a person who entertains lustful thoughts soon becomes addicted to those things they lust after, so much that they cannot help themselves, even if they hate doing this. The same thing happens with anxiety, fear, worry, and low self-esteem. But the Bible gives us a way to overcome negative thinking. We have the power to make our thoughts obey Christ. Here are some ways to overcome negative thinking. 1. Pray Prayer is an invaluable tool for overcoming negative thinking and asking God to change your life. Prayer has the power to change your life. Prayer changes things. Never underestimate the power of prayer, my friend. During the time you spend in prayer, you give your mind the opportunity to exercise spiritual skills. A prayerful believer is more spiritually conscious because their mind is learning more and more to work with the spirit. When there's unity between your spirit and your mind, your life will change. 
Also, the more you pray, the more you keep negative thinking away from you. How? Because when you pray more about the things you normally think negatively about, it changes how you see them. Through faith in God's ability to make things better, you'll think more positively about the situation and people in your life than you would on your own. When negative thoughts come to your mind, prayer is one of the best weapons to use against them. That's why the Bible asks us to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 2. Read and meditate on God's Word Spending time with the Word of God is crucial for spiritual growth and transformation. I've always said that we all come to God as raw materials. His Word is the tool He uses in transforming us from raw people to finished better people who shine as light. When you became a child of God, your spirit was saved, not your mind. However, God tells us that we have to translate that transformation from our spirit to our physical experience. And for that to happen, our minds must be renewed. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And it further adds in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. These are all spiritual and godly things. As you study and ponder on the truth of God's Word, the Holy Spirit transfers these truths to your mind as true, right, noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy thoughts. And when the mind is touched with this transformation, it learns to let go of the negativity it was used to and begins to embrace the newer possibilities in Christ. 3. Make faith confessions of God's Word What is a faith confession? A faith confession is when you speak what God's Word says about you instead of what your mind or circumstances say. Remember that the Bible says faith comes by hearing the Word of God. This doesn't just include what other people say to you, but also what you hear yourself saying to yourself. Your faith grows and your mind is transformed when you keep speaking God's Word over your life yourself. You can record yourself speaking the Word of God over your life and then stand in front of a mirror, point to yourself, and listen to the same things over and over again. Doing this constantly will fill your heart with light in such a way that negativity will find it harder to leak in. And even when it does, there will be answers inside of you because you're now more used to the word than to the negativity. 4. Let go of the past or anything that fills your mind with negativity. Letting go of the past or anything that fills you with negative thinking is another way to let God transform your life. Many of us are stuck and unable to receive God's transforming power because we're still clinging to the past experiences or other negativity surrounding our lives. Transformation will begin in your life the day you make up your mind to replace the negative thoughts with newer thoughts of God in your life. Instead of holding on to negativity, surround yourself with people and things that feed your mind and heart with positivity and the truth of God's Word. Your association and environment will either host God's presence or the devil's. God's using this message to invite you to a transformed life. All you need to do is open yourself to His work by following these four steps I just shared with you. As you follow them, you will overcome the negative thoughts in your life and give God the opportunity to bring great transformation into your life such that you'll not be able to connect who you were with who you are now. Have you ever felt like your problems are too much to handle and that you just want to run away? I know I have, but let me tell you something, you're not alone. Over the years, I've spent more time being anxious and worrying about things that are beyond my control than trusting in God and walking through the situations that make me afraid. 
When we face challenges, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and anxious. But did you know that worrying is actually counterproductive? In fact, it can even harm our health. That's why God tells us in the book of Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. To be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself also tells us not to worry about our lives. In Matthew 6, he says, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? He goes on to say that if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be given to us as well. Now, it's easy to say, don't worry, but it's another thing entirely to put it into practice. So, how can we apply this in our lives? First, we need to recognize that worrying is a habit that we need to break. Just like any bad habit, it takes time and effort to break it. We need to consciously choose to trust in God and give our worries over to Him. We need to focus on the present moment. Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We need to learn to live in the present moment, taking things one day at a time. You need to surround yourself with positive influences. This includes reading the Bible, listening to uplifting music, and spending time with other Christians who can encourage us in our faith. Today, I want to remind you of something that we all tend to forget when we are caught up in the chaos of life. We are children of God and we have a Heavenly Father who is always there to help us out. All we have to do is ask for His help and trust that He can do what needs to be done. It's easy to get wrapped up in our worries and problems, feeling like we are alone in the world. But we are not alone, and we don't have to bear the weight of our burdens by ourselves. In fact, if we try to do everything on our own, we will only end up feeling more overwhelmed and stressed out. Remember, you are not designed to take on everything and handle everything. You are a child of God, and your Heavenly Father is more capable of helping you through anything that comes your way. So don't be afraid to ask for His help. You see, trying to solve all your problems on your own is a recipe for stress and anxiety. No matter how strong, wise, or capable you may be, you were not designed to handle everything on your own. Now, I know it's tempting to rely on ourselves and look for solutions to our problems in the world. We might think that if we just work harder, plan better, or make more money, then everything will work out. But that kind of thinking only leads to more stress and worry. The truth is, the peace of mind and heart that we all crave can only come from one place, and that is God. He is the one who can give us the peace that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid, my friends. Put your trust in Him, and He will guide you through any problem or difficulty that you may face. And remember, you are not alone in your struggles. There are many others out there who are going through similar things, and we are all in this together. So reach out to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and lean on each other for support and encouragement. In John 14, 27, the Bible says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus promises us the gift of peace of mind and heart. This is a gift that the world cannot give us. So if you're feeling troubled or afraid, 
know that you can turn to God for help and find the peace that you need. Think of it this way. Imagine that you're carrying a heavy backpack full of rocks. It's weighing you down and making it hard to move forward. But then, someone comes along and offers to carry the backpack for you. You don't have to carry the weight on your own anymore. That's what it's like when you ask God for help. He takes the weight off your shoulders and helps you move forward with ease. Are you feeling overwhelmed and looking for ways to cure your worries? Are you constantly trying to impress everyone and looking for external validation? Well, my friends, it's time to shift your focus inward and turn to the Bible and prayer for strength and guidance. God does not want you to do it all alone. He wants you to recognize that He is there to lead you, walk you through, and guide you through every step of the way. And here's the deal. He doesn't want to just give you every resource you need to get through your problems. He wants to be everything you need in every situation. It's amazing how problems can be solved the moment you decide to trust God in everything. When you trust God, you don't have to figure anything out anymore. As you lean on Him, you take the pressure off yourself. You don't have to try to change things that you've already tried a million times to change. And the more you try to change, the more frustrated you become. Because you can just finally say, Well, God, I'm trusting you with this. And if you can't change it, then I guess it doesn't need to be changed. The only way you can learn to stop worrying and stop trying to figure things out is to let go and let God take the reins. But let's take a step back and talk about the root of the issue. Trying to make everyone happy with you. It's a futile pursuit that only leads to anxiety and stress. No matter how great a job you do, there will always be someone who is unhappy with your performance. It's an unavoidable fact of life. Just ask any politician or entertainer. Let's turn to Luke where Jesus and his disciples visit the home of Mary and Martha. Martha is busy with all the preparations, while Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to what he has to say. Martha is feeling overwhelmed and asks Jesus to tell Mary to help her out. But Jesus responds, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The moral of the story is that it's important to prioritize your spiritual well-being above all else. Mary chose to sit and listen to Jesus, which allowed her to grow internally and spiritually. Martha was distracted by the external preparations, which caused her to feel anxious and overwhelmed. So, my friends, Let's take a page out of Mary's book and focus on growing stronger internally to handle more. Let's prioritize prayer and time in the Bible and trust that God will guide us through every step of the way. Remember, you are a child of God and He is always there for you. In Isaiah 40, 30 and 31, it says, Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. When we feel overwhelmed, we can just say, God, I don't know what to do. Help me, please. We don't have to have all the answers or solutions. We just need to go to the one who does have them. Have you been on an emotional roller coaster? One moment you're up, and the next you're down. It's exhausting. But the good news is that God is always there to take care of us. We don't have to worry about the small stuff. Our worries can increase when we experience sudden or tragic events. But they can also pile up over time when the daily burdens of life weigh us down. Even good things like new opportunities can cause fear. So, 
What do we do when we face challenges and fears? We give them to God. We trust that He will take care of us. In Philippians 4, 6 and 7, NIV, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's okay not to have all the answers. It's okay to be vulnerable and ask for help. We're all human, and we all have struggles, but we're also children of God, and that means we have a loving Father who will never leave us or forsake us. So, let's surrender our worries and fears to Him and trust that He will renew our strength. Remember, you are a child of God, and He loves you more than you could ever imagine. You see, life can be tough sometimes, we face challenges that make us feel weary and weak. We may feel like giving up or running away from our problems. But if we are wise, we go to where there is help. We bring them to God. Because here's what God says to us in Isaiah 41. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God gives us strength when we are weak. He sees and knows everything. He sees the future and understands every angle of what is going on in your life right now. He understands how people are viewing it and perceiving it. He sees the best solution to your problems. When we worry, we are basically saying that we are afraid that our life is not going to be the way that we want it to be. But when we trust that God has the best solution, we are saying, God, I believe that you have the best way for me, even if it's not the path that I choose or that I came up with. We can trust that if we follow God and trust Him, He will give us every resource that we need every step of the way. And at the end, he can turn that into something wonderful and beautiful. Gaze upon the grandeur of stillness, for it is in this silent sanctuary that the divine essence speaks, echoing the familiar phrase, I am God. This phrase, lifted from the sacred book of Psalms 4610, is more than a mere verse. It is an invitation, a gentle beckoning to rest in the divine presence to hush the clamor of worldly distractions and to listen. Consider the mighty deeds of the Lord, how he dispenses justice upon the land, how he quells the turbulence of wars, how he breaks the weapons of conflict and consumes the chariots in an unquenchable fire. Yes, my friends, stand still. And in that stillness, let the knowledge of his divinity seep into your soul. Let his glory be exalted above all nations, let it resound throughout the earth. For the Lord of hosts walks with us. The God of Jacob, our unshakable fortress, is ever present. Psalms 46, with its rich tapestry of imagery, reassures us that in every circumstance, every ordeal, the Lord remains our refuge, our strength, and our bulwark against the tempests of life. The refrain, the Lord of hosts is with us, echoes not once, but twice reinforcing his unfaltering presence amidst our trials. Psalm 46 is a narrative spun in the third person, a narrative that seeks to remind the reader of the Almighty's omnipotence and his active involvement amidst our struggles. And yet, as we arrive at the 10th verse, a fascinating transformation unfolds. The narrative perspective shifts, pivoting from a third person perspective to a more intimate second person view. No longer does the verse speak about the Lord. Rather, in a profound twist, it is the Lord himself who addresses us, the readers and listeners, directly. It is in this moment of direct address that we find ourselves face to face with the divine in a deeply personal encounter with the Almighty. We are urged to lay down our burdens, to still our trembling hearts, and to stand firm in our faith, secure in the knowledge that God is with us by our side. This profound message is our anchor, 
our beacon of hope in trying times. Whether young or old, this timeless wisdom rings true. It inspires, it uplifts, it resonates. Through it, we are reminded that no matter the trials we face, we are not alone. So my dear friends, let us be still. Let us stand strong in our faith and let us always remember God is by our side. In the hushed silence of the hearts, let us invite the Lord's presence and hear His divine whisper. Psalms 46.10 Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We recall Apostle Paul's prophetic counsel to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 9, cautioning him about the challenges that would pepper the chronicles of the church. As people's hearts lean towards self-love and worldly pleasures over divine love, they would nurture a cold, unforgiving nature adorned with a veneer of piety, but lacking its true essence. This message echoes through the ages, warning not only Timothy, but all of Christ's disciples about the deceptive teachers intent on leading the innocent astray. My dear friends, my soul aches for a bond with God that is profound as the depths of the ocean, as limitless as the sky. I yearn for an encounter with Him, as intense as Moses' encounter with the burning bush. I long to face the adversities of life, unflinching and unafraid, with the courage of Daniel in the lion's den. I aspire to be a humble servant in God's divine kingdom, living a life of purpose, yearning to hear his voice say, well done, my faithful servant. Yet, I am under no illusions. The adversary will not stand by idly as I strive to ascend the ladder of faith, as I seek to fortify my prayers. The enemy will craft intricate plans aimed to dishearten and distract, to plant seeds of doubt and temptations designed to steer me away from God's divine plan for my life. However, let me assure you, I am not daunted. I refuse to live in fear or anxiety, for I am empowered by the divine who resides within me, infinitely mightier than any foe that threatens from the outside. Even as God prepares to elevate me and the adversary gears up the challenge, I stand firm, unshaken with the victory banner of Jesus held high. I commit to clothe myself with God's full armor, standing strong in faith forever and always. Remember, no matter the trials or tribulations that beset your path, stand firm and be still with God. Embrace the strength of your faith and know beyond any doubt, that God is still by your side. He is your refuge, your strength, your ever-present help in times of trouble. So, be still and stand strong in faith, for the Lord of all creation is with you always. In the silent whispers of our hearts, there's a call that resonates, echoing the words, abide with me, divine one. Or perhaps you found yourself in quiet contemplation pleading, are you there, Savior? Or maybe, Empower me, Heavenly Father. It's remarkable how a quartet of humble voices can encapsulate a universe of emotion. Over the years as I've journeyed through life and faith, I've come to a profound realization. The longing of His presence has magnified in my heart. The desire for His companionship has intensified, and the yearning for the Almighty to remain steadfast beside me has amplified. What lies beneath this deep-seated longing, you might wonder. The answer is simple. It's my utmost need for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I've tried charting my own course to no avail. I've encountered the bitter truth that without His guiding hand, victory remains elusive, breakthroughs turn into mirages, and peace of mind becomes a distant dream. Therefore, my soul yearns for Jesus Christ the only one who has extended an unconditional invitation in Psalm 55, 22, which says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. I'll confess, during trying times, my heart often repeats a simple mantra, a prayer whispered in faith. Stay with me, Jesus, stay with me, Lord. In moments of temptation, my spirit softly implores, Fortify me, Lord, fortify me, Jesus. And if you find resonance in these words, I urge you 
beloved child of God, to remain unyielding in the word of the Lord. Embrace the stillness, yet stand strong in your faith. Remember, God remains by your side, a steadfast pillar of strength and a beacon of divine love. His presence is a constant reminder that no matter the battles you face, you are never alone. God is with you every step of the way, offering His unwavering support and guidance. In the depths of life's challenges, when the weight of the world feels heavy upon your shoulders, there is a source of strength and comfort waiting for you. It is in those moments that you must take those burdens, those things that weigh you down, and surrender them to the loving embrace of Jesus Christ. Just as the psalmist declares in Psalms 121 verses 1 and 2, I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Today, my dear friends, your help comes from the Lord as well. The wisdom of David, a man after God's own heart, when faced with trials and tribulations, David cried out to the Lord. Before he sought answers from anyone else, before he jumped to conclusions or questioned why things were happening, he reached out to the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. Like David, I encourage you to cry out to the Lord for yourself. Call upon the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who has the power to calm storms and bring peace to your soul. In the midst of this chaotic world, it's essential to be sober and alert, for our adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But fear not, my friends, for we are not alone in this battle. 1 Peter 5 reminds us to resist the enemy and stand strong in our faith knowing that our brothers and sisters throughout the world are enduring similar sufferings. We are part of a global family of believers, and together we can find the strength to overcome. So, my dear friends, I implore you to take a moment to be still. Remember you are not alone. The Lord is your help, your refuge, and your strength. Be still and stand strong, for in Him you will find peace that surpasses all understanding. May your faith be unshakable, your spirit unyielding, and may God's presence guide you every step of the way. When the weight of the world seems to be pressing down on us, we must remember the powerful message from Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Just as the Hebrew Christians face persecution and challenges, we too must shed the burdens that hold us back and run with unwavering endurance in the race set before us. God Almighty, the eternal presence that transcends time and space is waiting for your call. He is the one who has been, who is, and who will forever be. When it feels like an uphill battle to even open your Bible or utter a prayer, call upon Jesus. He is the one who commands legions of angels, the holder of the keys to life and death. No matter what circumstance you find yourself in today, whatever trials and tribulations surround you, God desires for you to call upon Him. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 3, we read these comforting words, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. And in Psalm 50, verse 15, we find this promise. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Therefore, let me encourage you, my dear friend, to anchor your faith in God. When you meditate on his word, when you embrace his promises, he declares, trust me in your times of trouble and I will rescue you. He beckons, abide in me and I will restore you. And he invites, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So in the midst of your journey, shift your perspective. Let go of the weight that drags you down and instead fix your eyes upon the unfailing love and unshakable strength of the Almighty. God has the perfect solution for every situation you face. He possesses the precise amount of strength needed to uplift you in both the good and the challenging days. Today, my friend, I urge you to embrace this truth and let it transform your outlook. Reflect on the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, as recorded in 2 Timothy. Paul commends Timothy for following his teachings, way of life, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance. 
He acknowledges the persecutions and sufferings Timothy endured, yet ultimately triumphed over Paul's words as a reminder that standing firm requires not only faithfulness, but also the courage to endure hardships. Moreover, Paul urges Timothy to continue with what he has learned and to stay confident. Timothy is a reminder of the individuals who have taught and imparted wisdom into his life. This serves as a powerful reminder that we too are not alone in our journey. We have been blessed with the opportunity to learn from godly men and women who have paved the way before us. By following their examples, we can navigate the storms of life with great resilience. The concept of following is not a mere passive observance, but an active pursuit. In fact, the word followed in verse 10 implies walking closely alongside someone, conforming our lives to their character and actions. Timothy didn't just acknowledge Paul's example, he intimately imitated it for many years. Additionally, Timothy's growth and development were influenced by multiple teachers who poured into his life as indicated in verse 14. So dear friends, let us remember that even in the midst of life's fiercest storms, God is still by our side. Let us fix our eyes on Him, drawing strength from His faithfulness and the faithful ones who have gone before us. Together, let us stand firm, imitating their examples and following in their footsteps. By doing so, we will discover the resilience, hope, and unwavering faith needed to weather any storm that comes our way. Trust in God's promises, for He is faithful, and He will see us through. Here are some warning signs every Christian needs to look out for in these last days before the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Number one, the spirit of slumbering. The spirit of slumber is the spirit that weakens a person's commitment to spiritual things. It is a spiritual influence that causes disinterest and laziness towards the things of God. Jesus told the parable of the 10 virgins to illustrate how the kingdom of God will be in the last days. In this parable, Jesus made it clear that both parties, each of five virgins, represented purity, that is, the children of God. The parable was not one for the word, but a warning to believers who already had the light, or as in the case of the virgins, the lamps and the oil. Jesus said that while the virgins waited for the arrival of the bridegroom, they all fell asleep. Both the wise and the foolish parties fell asleep. While they were asleep, the announcement was made of the arrival of the bridegroom. They got up and trimmed their lamps to wait for him. However, because the foolish ones didn't carry extra oil, which is a representation of the grace and support of the Holy Spirit, they couldn't keep their lamps lit until the bridegroom arrived. When they decided to go buy oil, it was too late. Before they returned, he had entered the party with the virgins who were ready with their extra oil. Another parable Jesus gave on this subject was of the wheat and the weeds in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus shared of a man who sowed good seeds but woke up to discover that there were both good seeds and weeds in his field. Jesus said that as the man slept, his enemy came secretly and planted weeds among his good seeds. The spirit of slumbering will render the believer inactive or passive towards things they should be active about. This is one of the warning signs every Christian should be watching out for in these last days. Those distractions that want to keep you away from prayer, studying the Word, attending church services, or obeying God's Word, those things want you to slumber. A sign that you have begun to spiritually slumber is when you notice that the things that interested you before no longer interest you. You have begun to slumber when you can no longer, without praying, studying your Bible or fellowshipping with other believers. The Bible calls us to awake from every slumber and to receive the grace of the Lord to enable us to be on our guard and await His arrival. Ephesians 5, 14 through 17 says, This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. One of the dangers of spiritual slumber is that like the farmer who sowed good seeds 
and went to sleep, you will give the enemy, the devil, room to come in and plant seeds of diversion and destruction in your life. Before you know what is going on, you would realize that you're becoming comfortable with things that you normally would never tolerate in your life. That is a sign of slumbering. When you slumber, you allow the enemy to plant things in your life that develop to dampen your spiritual sensitivity. I pray that the Lord will awaken each one of us from every slumbering and shine his light on us in Jesus' name. Another sign to look out for in these last days as a Christian is Number 2. The Increase in Sin and Sinfulness Jesus said that in the last days, iniquity would multiply. Nowadays, you do not need to have a television to know what is going on in the world. You do not need to see the news to know how degenerated the world has become. The world has always been spiritually dead. But there were still some strong moral values being upheld in society. However, today, almost every sense of morality has been thrown out the window. Every form of sin and abomination known to the imagination is being explored and normalized in the world. We can wail all day, but it won't change the fact that these are all signs that the end is here. Although Christianity is not only about morals, we know that every good form of morality is upheld in our faith. The Bible teaches us a lot about morals because they have a place in our worship of God. The level of sinfulness in the world today is proof and a warning sign that the end is here and we must be on our guard. There was once a time when certain things were done in secret. Many people did not have the boldness to try them out because society frowned at them. This kept many temptations and pressures in check. However, the enemy has since stepped in to raise up pillars of temptations across the fields and platforms. Many forms of ungodliness and diverse abominations are being presented to us every day, even when we are in the comfort of our own homes. We must pray the Lord's Prayer that says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. And we must make sure we avoid everything that tempts us to sin. As we recognize this warning, it should help us to keep ourselves pure and holy unto God, our Redeemer, because one day we will appear before Him to account for our lives, and not one of us knows when that day will be. Another warning sign we must be on the lookout for as Christians is Number 3. Love for self over love for God The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. One of the reasons sin and much heartbreaking decay have crept into our society is because love for God, for righteousness, and for good morals have been replaced with selfish love and love for selfish gains. I once heard a man say that one of the roots of all sin is selfishness. People love themselves too much to deny themselves the things God says they shouldn't do. The flesh does not fear God, neither does it love Him. So it craves things without caring if God wants you to do them or not. Each time we take the side of our flesh, the result is a sin against God. The flesh tells you to slander, to hurt others, to hurt those who hurt you, to love only those who love you, and to do anything that makes you happy, even if it doesn't glorify God. Look around you today. The world has shown us what happens when we allow love for self to lead us more than love for God. People have been taught to embrace so much of the flesh and now we can see what happens when the flesh reigns. Unnatural desires, diverse abominations, corruption, crime, and injustice against humanity. Many parents have resorted to homeschooling their children because of the pollution spreading into our educational sectors. As fearful as it sounds, until the Lord comes, it will continue. 
However, as children of God, we must understand that these are warning signs from God of the end. These are signs for us to note and be weary about. Keep yourself and your family in the fear of the Lord. We are not led by our flesh or feelings, but by the Spirit of God. And lastly, another sign that warns every child of God in these end times is Number four, the falling away of many. One of the crucial signs that will characterize the end is the falling away of many from the faith. Jesus himself warned us that this would happen. In fact, many of the elect, saved believers, will be deceived in the last days in turn from following him. He said in Matthew 24, 10 through 11, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And with that, the apostle warned, let the person that thinks he stands be careful or else he will fall. So in these last days, it's not about how strong you are, but about how dependent you are on God's grace to sustain you. In these last days, even the strongest of saints might become a victim in these last days, there is a mass deception going on, even in the body of Christ, being orchestrated by false teachers and false believers. The aim is to drag as many believers as possible away from the saving truth of Jesus. Many people have turned from the faith because someone offended them, and they couldn't let it go. Others are turning because they feel disappointed by God. Some are turning because they aren't patient enough to wait until God meets their needs when the devil promises to meet everything at once. There are those who are turning even without knowing, and so the list goes. As a child of God who is sensitive about the things of God, you must know that these things are a warning sign from God. And what did Jesus say to do? He said in Matthew 24, 30 through 33, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. The purpose of these signs is to help us remember that God fulfills His word and never fails. So if you are like the virgins and have fallen asleep, you have to wake yourself up and get extra oil to keep your light burning so that you do not lose yourself. The purpose of these warning signs is to challenge us to keep standing for truth of God's light and never give up, no matter what happens. The purpose is to encourage ourselves that soon all the struggles and pain of this world and the difficulties that we have to deal with are about to end. The Lord who promised to come will come and we will be with him forever. Be encouraged, dear believer. Your wait will be worth it. Keep believing in the Lord. Don't give up and don't fear. He will come and he will save those who trust him from the pollutions of this world once and forever.